several months ago, we asked the people who are listening on the radio to write in and tell us that they were listening. We figured that for every one that wrote in, perhaps that would represent a hundred listening. We're trying to find out who was listening. Last week, we discovered a better way of finding out who was listening. Preach a sermon on the marriages for keeps. <clears throat> After all of the letters and notes and phone calls, some long distance, we decided that we have an elephant by the tail, and uh, we have made a decision in our staff meeting to dedicate the first quarter of this school year to Wednesday nights on marriage in the home. We are only going to be able to scratch the surface here, and perhaps even there. We'll try to have all the resource people available that can help us, and we trust that the midweek meeting during the last quarter of this year, starting October 1, will be useful for that purpose. Another thing that was demonstrated last week is the foolishness of preaching. And uh, this week we'd like to deal with questions that came in as sort of a sequel to uh, last week. As you recall, we talked about Matthew, the 19th chapter, and we discussed the question concerning the finality of marriage in the eyes of Jesus. Marriage is not open-ended, and uh, we were not trying to, in the process, break up homes that presently exist. We're thankful for those who were on the verge of divorce last week after the sermon uh, that they waited a week to listen once more. Our purpose is to close the door from anticipated heartbreak, anticipated because there was not enough thought put into it. Wouldn't it be true that if young people really thought that marriage was for keeps and that there was no open-ended approach to it, that they'd give a little longer look at it today, is this possible, before they rush into it? I'd like to propose that the longer you study this and the closer you get into Scripture, that instead of it becoming more liberal and the door becoming more open, it goes more tightly shut. Try it. And uh, again, I'd like to invite you to not believe anything we say here today. Only what comes from God's Word and only what you check out for yourself. Someone called and they said, well, we heard such and such from someone that if you we mentioned the name, you'd really know who it was. I don't care who it is. And what they say about marriage in the home, it means nothing unless it comes from God's word. Isn't that true? Human philosophy and speculation, logic and reason may be good, but it, it's worth nothing for authority. All right, we notice that marriage is not open-ended, except for one exception, which Jesus called fornication. The first question that came after last week was at the door when one of our Bible department men said, What does it mean what God hath joined together? And he said, um, I am afraid that there are many marriages that I've had a part in that God had nothing to do with. Well, I said, you don't ask me questions like that. Uh, someone far my senior, give me the answer. And I said, you're supposed to give the answer. I've looked for an answer, and this is as close as I can get. Marriage was God's idea in the first place. The institution of marriage came from God. And anyone who takes a vow and makes a promise toward marriage 
qualifies. Now, if you don't take that rigid position, then it seems to me the door is wide open to speculate and to bring in human reasoning and logic as to what it means what God hath joined. It would be very easy for me if I was unhappy in my home to say, well, I never have been happy, and so my marriage must not have had anything to do with God's being in it or his blessing, and uh, so God didn't join me, therefore I might as well get out. Um, I realize that the answer we're suggesting is only from logic and reason, too. But so far, I haven't found a theological answer to that that we can give you chapter and verse for. There's something else. A couple of weeks ago, we read a statement in the volume to the church called The Testimonies, page 504, number 4. There is not one marriage in 100 that results happily, that bears the sanction of God, and places the parties in a position better to glorify him. The evil consequences of poor marriages are numberless. Not one marriage in 100, not even that much, which would indicate maybe what? One half of a marriage in 100? Now, if I was going to take that and say, therefore, that only one half of a marriage in 100 would represent what God hath joined, What would happen? I believe on the basis of that that the evidence would suggest that uh, you could read it this way. There is not one marriage in one hundred that God hath joined that results happily, that bears the sanction of God. That sounds kind of weird. But uh, we don't believe in once married, always married, unless you stay married. And God can have his sanction in the marriage at its beginning and not have his sanction in it later. Is that true? A person can be converted and have a relationship with God at the beginning of his Christian life and not have it later. And just because we read in the past history of our church that not one in one hundred understood the experience of justification by faith or righteousness by faith does not mean not even one in one hundred ever experienced really coming to God. So let's leave the door open for God having something to do with marriage as an institution, even though there are many marriages that uh, have degenerated to the place where God is not pleased. The second question was, in Romans 7, where it talks about a person being married to their husband as long as uh, their husband lives, verses 2 and 3, does it mean that if a person is divorced and remarried, and the husband is still living, and they don't have Bible grounds, quote, for that remarriage, that they continue to sin again and again, on and on, or is it only the first time? You see, the opinion prevails with many, and it's a very comfortable opinion, that if I divorce my wife and remarry without fornication being involved, that the uh, adultery happens only the first time after I'm remarried. After that, the first time is sort of cleared the records. Now, where anyone ever came up with that, I don't know. Because the text, if you look at it in Romans 7, 2 and 3, says very clearly that she is married, bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives. And as I understand it, if the husband is still living and she's still bound to him, what she does in terms of a new marriage has nothing to do with losing those bounds. Give it a thought. Read the text. Read the verses carefully. Check your commentaries. Analyze it. See what you come up with. The next question was, 
When we talk about there being no marital problem that cannot be solved to the satisfaction of both husband and wife, where both are willing to follow the principles Christ laid down in his word and the Sermon on the Mount, does this include fornication and unfaithfulness? Some people got the idea that regardless of what happened, we should stay with our mates and companions and continue to follow the principles of the Sermon on the Mount. And by the way, this is certainly an option. God's Word makes it clear that when there has been infidelity in a marriage, divorce is not mandatory, reconciliation is really an option. Isn't that true? But our primary emphasis at that point had to do with people who discovered that their dispositions and personalities were not congenial. Our primary emphasis last week was that people who are married and discover that the only thing they have in common is that neither one of them likes chocolate-covered Brussels sprouts, they can still stay together. And they can still, by the grace of God and by the principles of his word, discover happiness and growing togetherness and the kind of peace and love and joy that God has to offer. But on a secondary basis, this principle can also include infidelity and those people who have, because love goes deep, tried to forgive and have succeeded by God's grace, have often grown closer after the heartbreak. This has happened, hasn't it? The next question that came in had to do with separation. Is it wrong to live apart from husband or wife? Is it wrong for people to be separated? Now, if you've studied this subject, you find that there are a few major passages in Scripture that are predominant on the theme. Of course, there are references to Christ in the Church and spiritual relationship, like into marriage, divorce, and so on. But your major passages to the point specifically on marriage and divorce are uh, Matthew 19, Matthew 5, 6, uh, Math, um, Romans the seventh chapter, 1 Corinthians 7, and Deuteronomy 24. Your major passages to study in what we call the spirit of prophecy are only three, only three. Now, this little lady had a lot to say on marriage. She had little to say on divorce. One of them is Mount of Blessing, page 63 to 65. Another one is Adventist Home in the 340s. And the third one is in the book Selected Messages, volume 2, in the 340s. And then you have the list and the array of quotes rare, unpublished statements. Have you ever heard of rare, unpublished statements? My, we love to make hay out of those. I have heard of a rare, unpublished statement that says, or that indicates, or that suggests. I don't know about you, but I resist the rare, unpublished statements. And the people who always like to pull them out, look, I've got a rare unpublished statement here. If God is not big enough to, in his remnant church, that is remnant according to pure doctrine and belief, to um, allow to get published that which is going to be the most pertinent and helpful for his people, then God isn't big enough to be God. And I read that God is still in charge of his work. And that though all of the workmen bearing the heaviest responsibilities, true or untrue, faithful or unfaithful, were laid aside, God's work would still go forward. Last page of volume 7 of the testimony. Then I think that God is big enough to get published what we ought to have. But there is evidence, if you read your sources here, that separation is not a sin, and sometimes it's necessary. I have seen people, and I have read about people, 
in the writings of this little lady, who have become so absolutely impossible in their life together that their only option is to go straight to hell as long as they're together. And their one chance for uh, recovery would be to be apart for a period of time for the purpose of recouping their spiritual resources. There has to be a starting point somewhere. And you'll find that even recommended by this little lady. Of course, what often happens is when people separate for the purpose of recouping their spiritual resources, they begin recouping on other fronts. And that's not so good either. But if they honestly are engaging in separation for that purpose, sometimes it can be a benefit. And you can find in 1 Corinthians, the seventh chapter again, verse 11, that even the Apostle Paul allows for separation on occasion. So let's not take the position that separation is a sin. Sometimes it can be a help. And please spare the phone calls tonight of those who have planned to be separated as of tonight. Next question. Why does the church take action concerning people who are divorced and remarried, quotes without Bible grounds? Isn't the discipline of going through a divorce and breakup of your home enough without the church adding insult to injury and disciplining the person in addition. Now, I don't know exactly all that the church leaders and administrators have had in mind, but I would like to suggest that the primary reason for churches taking action is not for discipline. It is for the purpose of facing the problem of influence. Did you hear that? If I understand the church's philosophy correctly, the defensible position is that if the church treats lightly divorce and remarriage without biblical reasons for it, that the integrity and the image of the marriage institution will go down. And after a while, young people and other people looking on will say, well, it's no big deal. The church puts up with it and allows it. The church does not take action for disciplinary measures. It takes action because of the giant factor of the influence upon the integrity of the marriage institution. Does this make sense at all? And you find evidence as you study this in these sources. That there are some people who may be accepted by God who will have to be treated as heathen and publican by the church because of the influence factor. But don't forget how Jesus treated heathen and publicans. Do you recall? He ate with them. He fellowshiped with them. He did not shun them. They were welcome in his presence. And uh, I admire the people who have been in a heartbreak situation and discovered their faults perhaps too late after they were blind but their eyes became open and they saw the damage that their actual membership and influence might be in a church institution in preserving the marriage integrity and have been content instead of butting their heads against the fence all the time trying to get back in the church and get their names inscribed on the books thinking that this would guarantee them a place in heaven, have decided to simply not fight the issue, to leave their case before God, and continue to fellowship with God's people. I've seen it happen. I admire these people and their clear thinking. It is the person who has gotten the idea that he cannot get to heaven unless his name is inscribed on a church record 
that continues to butt his head against the fence trying to get back in. And after all, it's a very surface legalistic approach to salvation. But may I propose to you that anyone who's gone through the heartbreak of a divorce and a remarriage or separation or whatever else does not need to be treated with abandon on the part of other people and church members. He should be treated with love and acceptance and kindness. Can you accept that? We don't shun them. Jesus didn't, and he never would. Remember that sinners love to be in Jesus' presence. And it was the acceptance that he exhibited in their behalf that transformed their lives and brought them to repentance. Another question is, well, where do the people who hold the liberal view get their view? And there is a liberal view. You know how it goes, do you? It is that when Jesus expanded his um, law in the Sermon on the Mount that he pointed out the, the thought is sufficient. You don't have to kill. You can already have hate in your heart. And you don't have to commit adultery. All you have to do is to lust. And so the conclusion is that if you commit adultery in your mind, that this frees the companion, or if your companion does, that frees you. Well, now, if you're going to take that position, how many would uh, go scot-free? Should we have them stand this morning? Well, someone says there's another approach that isn't based simply on that. It's based upon another premise. And you'll find this in liberal books on divorce and remarriage outside your own church. As far as I know, they have not been published in your church. You'll find them, and some of our pastors are capitalizing upon these. They think they sound good and make sense. And this is the way it goes. That in Romans 7, these verses that we were in a minute ago, where it talks about a woman being bound to her husband by the law as long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loosed from the law of her husband. They say this passage includes more than physical death. And they go ahead and read the rest of the verses that follow and say that Paul is making a spiritual application in the Christian life. So that a person is dead to the law if he has done it, become alive in Christ. Well, they say, he's not really dead, he's dead spiritually to the law. And so they stretch the point in the passage and say that because Paul has, is talking about spiritual things, therefore his illustration of husband and wife must be talking about spiritual things as well. You know, it's very easy. Instead of making the illustration stand on all fours, they make the application stand on all fours and get the, the illustration up on all fours in the process. And by a clever maneuvering of some kind of uh, false ecclesiastical thinking, they come up with this premise, therefore, that you don't have to be physically dead in order to have a dead relationship. That if you have a dead relationship, you are free from that relationship even though the mate might still be living. Do you see how this works? Very interesting. And so they come up with these conclusions that unfaithfulness in the marriage is based not upon what you commit as what you omit. Well, this certainly cannot be faulted. They have a point there. But it is not a divorceable point. You accept that at all. Let's follow that through a little further. They say that uh, the commission of adultery follows after a long time of simply omission of many other things. Granted, granted. 
There's much more to being faithful to a wife or a husband than simply not committing adultery, isn't there? If I come home at night and my wife rushes to me and says, What happened today? And the last thing in the world I want is to recite everything that happened today. I want to sit down and lean back in the chair and kind of doze off into some kind of uh, coma. <laughs> and I don't talk to her, and I don't communicate, and this goes on day after day. I'm being unfaithful to my wife, aren't I? Regardless of how I feel about it. Unfaithfulness can happen on all kinds of levels, all kinds of frontiers. Um, take, for instance, this one that someone wrote about. You know, we made a promise when we were married that we would uh, leave father and mother and would cleave unto our mate. Well, this is an exaggeration. I'm asking you to be my wife. However, there are certain qualifications. First, I wish it understood that I love my mother more than I do you. This is understandable, I'm sure, when you consider that I have known her so much longer than I have you. Second, if it comes to a crisis with respect to any basic decision, of course, I will consult my father rather than you. You are still young and inexperienced, whereas my father is older and very wise. He is the head of a business in which I wish to make a name for myself so you can understand how I feel. Third, I am reserving my room with my parents because I plan to spend most of my time in their home. Our family is very close, and I feel I should preserve the family unity as it has been in the past. My nine brothers and sisters mean much to me, so I'm sure you will not mind if I spend most of my time with my family. I hope you will not mind staying alone. Fourth, a word about my property. You must understand that it belongs to me exclusively. If you accept my proposal, I shall want you to sign legal documents making no claims on my property or money. I find it hard to say goodbye to my money. I am sure a clever girl like you will be able to find a job that will support you. Oh, yes. Another thing. I cannot bear sickness, tears, or sorrow, so please do not expect me when we are married to give you any sympathy and attention. I need my sleep and will not want to be bothered with your problems. Bear your own crosses. Keep your chin up. I do want you to be my wife, and as such you will have the full responsibility of our children, the meals, and all household duties, so that I shall be free to give my full attention to my mother, father, brothers, sisters, my possessions, and my business. You are a nice girl, and I feel sure that we should have some nice times together. Will you say yes? If you do, I shall ask my mother if it's all right. If there is a wedding, your family will stand the expense. Well, uh, ridiculous, of course. Of course. But uh, take a long look at some of the things that we call faithfulness just because we haven't been out on a companion. We may have been very unfaithful on other aspects of the marriage vow. Is that possible? But the truth is, regardless of all of the possibilities of unfaithfulness, on whatever level or perimeter, they don't happen to be divorceable unfaithfulnesses. Study it. And if you find yourself with a dead relationship, even though no one has committed a wrong act yet, what do you do about it? Take off or go to your knees? We've taken the position earlier that every topic we begin with is going to end at the same point, your private life with God. And that is the answer to this dilemma as well. Is it not? That's the answer. If your marriage is growing thin, don't look for an out. Go to your knees. How long has it been since you prayed together? And praying together is one of the hardest things. much easier to pray in public than it is for me to pray with my wife. Why? Because you don't know me, she does. It's much easier to teach a Sabbath school lesson than it is to have family worship. How long since you've paid attention to the spiritual things in your own home? That's where the resources are. You don't look for the first exit.
Faithfulness is true. It is not based so much on what you don't do, in terms of committing wrong sins or acts, but on what you do, what you do. But it just so happens that although that is true, lust, as in the Sermon on the Mount, is not divorce potential, even though it is called adultery by Jesus. May we take the position on this basis, that there are two kinds of adultery, one that is divorce potential and one that is not. Or someone says, you're getting legalistic. If you simply define adultery and freedom from the marriage on the basis of some physical act, you're getting legalistic. Then there is a little lady who wrote a lot of books who was legalistic. Adventist home, page 341. Nothing but the violation of the marriage bed can either break or annul the marriage vow. She does not say nothing but the violation of the marriage mind, the marriage bed. Legalistic? Okay, legalistic. Lust is not divorce potential. It wasn't in the days of Moses. No one was stoned to death because he lusted. Well, you say, how would you know? Well, of course, that's part of the problem. That's also part of the problem today, just as much as in the Old Testament days of Moses. Is that true? Who knows who's lusting? And if you find the definition of fornication, the closest you'll come to it, as far as I've been able to study, it is a sinful sexual relationship with another. That's what fornication is. A sinful sexual relationship with another. Well, now, there's one little loophole that many people will hold on to tight, and that is that Ellen G. White seems to liberalize the thing. And for an example, and the only example I know of published, Adventist Tome, or rather Selected Messages, Volume 2, page 342. I'm reading counsel to a father who is trying to break up his son's marriage because, according to his understanding, his son was remarried without biblical foundation. And this is what she said to him. I would say that his case cannot be improved by leaving his present wife. It would not better the case to go to the other woman, in this case his original wife, in the question. Leave your son with the Lord. I am so sorry for the man, for his course is in such a shape that it will not answer to be meddled with, for there are difficulties upon difficulties. I would say that the Lord understands the situation, and if he will seek God with all his heart, he will be found of him. God will be found of him. If he will do his best, God will pardon and receive him. I would gladly do something to help this poor man to make things right, but this cannot be done as matters are now situated without someone's being wronged. You'll have to admit that this little lady also had kindness and understanding from the Lord, as well as any kind of legalistic charge you might level. Do you know to whom this was written? To a father who was trying to break up his son's marriage many years after his remarriage. Well, now, if you're unhappy with your home and you're looking for an out, you can hug Selected Messages, Volume 2, to your heart. And you can say, look, there's an out. But take a second look. The only thing that appears to be a liberalizing of the rigid position of Scripture on this subject by Ellen White is where she is trying to face the fact 
of what can and cannot and should not be done with situations that already exist. Is this clear at all? She is not recommending, in fact, she is criticizing situations that already exist and have existed for years being dealt with in a harsh manner. She says, leave these cases to the Lord. By the way, she's not talking here about membership or church membership or non-membership. It's not the issue. And she was very severe upon the father who was trying to break up this marriage. In other words, John, the ninth chapter, could very easily apply the last verse. If you were blind, there would be no sin. But because you say you see, your sin remaineth. If I'm the kind of person who's going to take this kind of story and try to twist it to suit my own fancy and my own desires, my own purpose, I have my own built-in problems that can seriously be questioned already. Isn't that true? So I'd like to suggest to you again today, if you study for yourself, you are not going to find an easy out. It is not there. If you want an easy out, then you can go to the sick position of depending upon the logic and reason of human minds, and you always find someone who will say what you'd like to hear. You can find it. But since when has decision-making concerning basic, deep, eternal issues had as its basis of authority some other human mind? It's not safe, is it? Extremely dangerous. Well, we've dealt with some of these questions which we felt we had to. Without stressing very much yet in this series, love. The real problem in marriage breakdown is lack of communication, we say. And we say the lack of communication is based upon six or eight problem areas. Money, religion, in-laws, children, lack of things in common, sex, lack of reconciliation, misunderstanding of roles. But suppose a person was able by some stretch of the imagination to line up on all of these eight problem areas and he had no problem. Suppose that he was able to go to the local IBM machine and you can find it now through insight, isn't it? You can approach the local IBM machine and you can find two people who are theoretically supposed to be absolutely compatible. I saw a cartoon on it one time and it was more real than it was funny. Two people, they have the IBM marriage. Everything is perfect. Compatibility to the skies. And they're trying to figure out what the problem is because they're not getting along. And they discovered the problem. They didn't love each other. The IBM machine cannot produce love. May I propose to you young people who are not married yet that God beats any IBM machine? Because he not only can help two people get together who belong together in terms of the compatibility scene, but he can also produce love because love is of God. We probably ought to talk about that next time. Love, that's it. That's the main ingredient. Let's not take it for granted in marriage. 1 Corinthians 13 in its modern version says it this way. This love of which I speak is slow to lose patience. It looks for a way of being constructive. It is not possessive. Love has good manners. It does not pursue selfish advantage. It is not touchy. It does not keep account of evil or gloat over the wickedness of the other. Love knows no limit to its endurance, no end to its trust, no fading of its hope. It can outlast anything. 
It is, in fact, the one thing that still stands when all else has fallen. And if you've discovered that love has grown thin, please join me on your knees for where love comes from. Shall we pray? Dear Father in heaven, we thank you that marriage was your idea, not ours. We thank you that the love that comes from heaven is an inexhaustible love. Forgive us from living at arm's length from you and therefore at arm's length from love. Please bring us closer to you and to each other in the process. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. You have been listening to another special American Christian Ministries presentation. This recording has been digitally reprocessed from the original audio cassette or reel-to-reel in order to make this CD available. The audio quality was improved as much as possible. International copyright, American Christian Ministries. All rights reserved. To order a copy of this or other presentations or for a free catalog, please call toll-free 800-233-4450. International calls dial 717-652-7000. You may also order from our secure website at www.americanchristianministry.org. There you will discover the largest selection of authentic Adventist preaching available. You can trust ACM. There's no compromise here. If American Christian Ministries has been a blessing to you, why not take a moment just now and send us a note or an email with your testimony. We'll share it with the speakers and volunteer workers to encourage them. Your prayers and continued financial support are very important to ensure the continuation of this ministry as we help prepare America and the world to meet Jesus Christ. He is coming soon.